Good morning, everyone. I know you've been thanked many times, but from myself as well, just thank you so much for being here. So my name is Natalie Coles, and I'm the Senior Project Manager for the project. So my job is really to make sure that all the pieces that make the project happen, happen. So from making sure the system gets designed the way it should, to having ethical approval, to working through the questionnaire and liaising with the team that you work, that is my job. And just before I'm gonna invite Sarah to talk a bit more about the data, I just wanted to talk to you about the two studies we've run so far in Brainwaves. One being the consent trial that we ran at the end of last year into the beginning part of this year, and the pilot study for the cohort study, which was in April this year. So, um, in September last year, we ran a consent trial, which was really to test different levels of consent that young people would give when they take part in research. So we had 12 research schools take part. I think some of you are here who've taken part. And we had about 3,800 students um, give us their data. And what we did is we tested these five different levels of consent, where we started with them giving full consent to everything. Yes, I'll answer anything right through testing things where we would ask them consent before every questionnaire, giving them a bit more information, to right at the end going, nobody will ever know anything about you, this is completely anonymous, how do you feel about getting giving us an answer here? Because we really want to know, you know, we're looking at, at some data now with running around missing data and how we get correct information from young people. So that's our aim. Um, we are also alongside this online study that we did, we're also doing focus groups with people. And again, some of you might be doing focus groups in your schools, where we've got smaller groups, face-to-face -face meetings, and getting some real information from these people. And that's been really informative. In the development of this consent trial and for our cohort study, we've got a young person's advisory group that is made up of about 18 young people between the ages of 16 and 18 who meet when we have questions to ask them and they've helped us look through the design for the development of the system through all the questionnaires and were really insightful when we were asking questions about what we could ask the young people. And um, there were some questions we ourselves thought, can't ask a young person this. And they were like, no, ask this. We really want to talk about this. And I think that's wonderful to have that at our disposal as well. So that was our consent trial. And then we had our um, pilot study for the cohort. And we had just under 7,300 students take part, which is phenomenal for a study of this, for pilot study especially. And as you will see, looking at the top graph, we love that the students, there wasn't a, a drop off somewhere. The students took part quite well across it and where they ran out of time or they stopped answering. The point is that in some studies, you see a drop where students decide they don't want to take part anymore. Here we saw a really cons con consistent like line going down to show us that the students did take part. We had 20 research schools take part, um, including six, six form colleges in this. And of course, the study had full ethical approval that was done through the university. And we followed strict data protection guidelines that is also checked by the university. And very excitingly, we have now got full access to the data. Now we've gone through all the things that we have to do and data analysis has started. And before I hand over to Sarah, who will um, talk a bit more about that um, and how we do that, I just wanted to point out that we know we are not perfect. Right. So what have we learned so far? <laughs> Firstly, one of the things that is very important in a cohort study is that we need to be able to recontact these young people. If we don't, it's just a data sample that we get at one point. We need to be able to have them give us information now and in the future. So to be able to recontact them, we do ask them for the contact information. And to make sure we don't have blue bunny 10 at madeupemailaddress.com, we do ask them to verify their email addresses. And what we thought might be a problem, but might not, actually did end up triggering a bit of a problem. Because on one day specifically, we had 1,200 students take part. And all those emails going through to verify email addresses caused IT flags to be raised. We are now very aware of that. 
and we've got some great plans in place for November, but we are very aware that that was a problem and I apologize if any of you had any of those IT issues while you were taking part. We are all human, including the students, including all of us, and the complicated codes that we had for the students input did cause some problems. So because we wanted to be very secure, we had zeros and excess and smalls and highs and all that, all that but that did cause some confusion. I think we had some issues with some of the codes. Again, we've, got, we've learned from this and we're making changes for November. This one we had quite a lot. I am sure the school will be able to see my answers is what some of the students were saying. But we just wanna make sure you know that the information was stored very securely the identifiable information from the students were kept like completely apart from the information that the data that the data is being analyzed from. So they have got it in a system called Keycloak. It's separate. That's the only way we can recontact them to know that. But the data that's being analyzed will never have identifiable information with it. So if your students are asking that, we will not be able to tell you who they are. So you will not know who they are for answering that information. But despite these things that we've learned and that the problems, small, you know, things that happened, um, we have got data. And that is very, very exciting. And we have had for the study 7,253 kids log in. And out of that, 7,067 kids gave their consent to take part. That is phenomenal. And on that high of a wonderful data numbers, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Professor Sarah Baumeister, who is the one analyzing the data and going to take us through the next steps. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. It's really, really nice to meet you all. And um, just from me, I really want to thank you all for uh, participating in the Brainwave study. Um, I can only imagine the logistics that you've been juggling in order to participate with this project, and we really do value you very much. And to think that we have over 7,000 children's data, which was collected in just over three weeks, is phenomenal. And we're really excited about the outcomes. So as John mentioned, the cold face, I'm at the cold face of the data. <laughs> and, um, Yes, sometimes I feel a little bit blacker than others, and, but here I am, and I'm hoping to tell you a little bit about this side of the research. It's a side that you probably don't always see. So Natalie's already said we have 7,067 who consented, which is fantastic. I'm going to just tell you a bit about the challenges, pre-processing, what we're doing with the data, and when you can expect to see some outcomes. So um, it's not as simple as we've got a questionnaire, they've um, logged their responses and we get a nice, neat, tidy data set and we can run some statistics in a package. First of all, we face formatting challenges. So we receive from our Swansea colleagues a CSV data set, but not just one single clean, tidy data set. It's multiple data sets according to the section that the child has actually completed. So we have multiple data sets. So that's the first challenge. It's also in CSV format. For those of you familiar with Excel, we don't analyze in Excel. So we have to work with this. We have a very good data scientist who's very kindly volunteered his time to the Brainwaves project who's been doing this. And we extract it out. We put it into a software where we can analyze it. Stata and Python. For those of you who do enjoy a little bit of data geeking out, um, but that's basically what we do. And that actually takes quite some time. Um, and that's why we give it to him to do and rather that we do it ourselves. Then we have missing data. So some children, as Natalie showed that graph, they start, they give their consent, they give their sociodemographics. But as the questionnaire goes on, there's certain questions that they skip or perhaps they stop a little bit earlier, but every data point is valuable to us. We don't just say, well, this child hasn't completed the questionnaire, therefore their data is not important. What we do is we apply statistical methods that take into account that that child 
did not answer question 156. And the rest of their data is still taken into account. And we do that through statistical methods. So I just want to say that every data point is valuable and we manage the missing data. So why do we have so many questions? Uh, we have over 230 questions. It's a very long questionnaire. As Natalie said, we have a YPAG group. We ran this past and we said, this is really long. What do you think about answering all of this? And some of the children who have um, dyslexic challenges or who are perhaps neurodiverse said, well, they'd rather have too many questions that nobody really can answer and they don't feel like they couldn't answer it only because they didn't get to the end. So this was really informed by our young people. Um, also, another reason we have so many questions is because mental health and well-being is an incredibly complex subject, as you are all aware here. It's not just, well, hand over a depression questionnaire, hand over a happiness questionnaire, put the two together and we'll work it out. It is really complex and we really want to make this a groundbreaking study that delivers on topics which have really never been measured at this scale before. Again, we ask the YPAG, are you comfortable asking about uh, us asking about these type of questions? And they said, yes, this is really important. We're, we're not asked about these questions. So we've included them. So that's why it's really comprehensive. Why do we have so many sociodemographic social media and school questions when this is a mental health and well-being study? The reason is because these interact heavily. A child that is um, heavily on social media or um, is having school problems or is happy at school, it's going to influence their mental health and well-being. And this, again, you're all aware of that. We also want to know about who are they living with at home? Do they have a challenging home life? Um, do they have low socioeconomic status? Again, these are questions we've asked because these drive, mediate, moderate, and interact with mental health and well-being. So how do we work with the data set? So once it's extracted out and we now have it in a nice format for running some statistics, we have to merge all those separate data sets together. Again, if there's one ID or anything that mismatches, that's that we have to deal with and manage. We also rename the variables. So for example, if one question says, um, oh, I'm going to off the top of my head, um, are you bullied on the way home from school, et cetera. We cannot work with variables that length when we're trying to run statistics. So we do a renaming process where we shorten it right down. So we have the key information, but it's nicer and shorter to work with. We also have to recode all these questionnaires. So within this 230 uh, question questionnaire, we have embedded different individual validated questionnaires. They're all coded differently. One might say total score means you have depression, or one might mean, one might be that you reverse code certain questions and you positive code others and you times are, this really does take time. So we will be working on doing this recoding mm -hmm. over the next few months and that's my summer job. <laughs> and so what do we initially look at with our data so say it's all nicely processed and it's very tidy this is not from the data this is just an example we look at distributions we look at do we have in a class a people scoring high low and in the middle this is really important to inform us whether our questions are measuring what we want to measure it also informs our statistical processes going forward. Some statistical methods, we can't, we have to change the data, just um, modify it, transform it, if it's perhaps all what we call positively skewed. We've got all the children uh, scoring up this side of the axis. And likewise, if they're all down that side, we have to just clean up that data so that we can run the statistical analyses. We also then look at, again, this is not from brainwaves, we look at correlations on the left-hand side. We look at what's associated with what. So is bullying associated with depression? Is well-being associated with sleep? 
And then we also run some regression analyses, looking at which variables predict others. So these are our initial investigations, and this is the type of information which you'll receive in your reports later after the summer, and we'll have a comprehensive profile of the data. Now I have some good news. Um, the data scientists I spoke about and myself, we geek out a little bit about data, <laughs> and we worked all weekend to bring you some preliminary sneak peek information <laughs> on key things that you're all interested about. So we looked at biological sex and sexual identity. We looked a little bit at bullying, social media and socioeconomics. So we took some low hanging fruit that didn't need too much uh, complex uh, pre-processing. So we found that uh, we had a healthy balance between male and female as expected. We also had some androgynous um, uh, pupils as well. So it, it looks like we have a nice balanced proportion of biological sex. We also looked at sexual identity. So on the left hand side, you can see the predominant identity is heterosexual in the dark blue. But on, on the right hand side, we burst out that pie. Thank you, uh, Julian, uh, we, for the pretty graphics mm -hmm. compared to my boring ones that I gave him. And on the right hand side, you can see our children are really feeling free to have non heterosexual uh, sexual identities, and they've um, recorded that in their responses. Um, an important one, I managed to look at poverty as measured by food bank use and risk of homelessness. Now, food bank use is 2% of our pupil population. And I think that this is a really important thing, um, aspect to think about, that our children, 2% of them, are using uh, food banks. And if you think about 2% on a population of 6,000, that's not just a couple. That is uh, something that really feeds into where do we take our brainwaves data? Well, I think that this, these type of metrics really inform policy and intervention. On the right-hand side, we have risk of homelessness. Now, actually, 5% said at some time they have um, experienced a risk of homelessness. Um, on the, uh, the blue is, um, is they don't have any risk, and on the brown it is I don't know. Then bullying. I think that all of you, um, as teachers, uh, this is an incredibly important topic for, for us to look at for you and how it impacts mental health and well-being. And as you can see, we've broken it down in our questionnaire to every day, most days, weekly, and two to three times per month, and also never been bullied or they're just teased. So these are metrics which we can now work with. We can take these metrics to understand how these, this report is impacting mental health and well-being. And then high social media use. On average, children are reporting six and a half hours use per day. And I can tell you that this scale went from zero to eight hours plus and over 300 children reported social media use of eight hours plus. And importantly, when I ran um, some regressions and correlation analyses, and remember this is just a brief preliminary, so I haven't got the metrics here, but it was uh, associated with a re uh, depression, social anxiety, and also reported bullying. So the more social media, um, the more negative impact um, is reported. So where to now? Well, my summer is data processing um, and data analysis. So we will be working our way through the multiple, multiple questionnaires. We'll be recoding, we'll be cleaning, and we'll be able to extract out a little bit more complex analyses than I've presented here. I was really keen to show you a snapshot but that's what uh, we are heading towards. So thank you very much.